Good morning, good morning, good morning. Well, are you excited to be in church today? Yeah. Amen. I believe God has answers for us today that will uh, help set us free and help our feet walk on the path that, that He designed for us. You know, as uh, Pastor Fred was sharing about the offering, I was thinking about uh, the title of this morning's message or the question that was asked. And the question that was asked is this, why do bad things happen to good people? And one of the things that I, I was thinking about as he was, uh, again, sharing something that according to uh, Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Or maybe that's Matthew 6, 18. But um, no, I think that's you can't serve two masters. A 6, 18, then 21, it goes in. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. But um, when you have the right foundation... You don't need as much of an explanation. And the, when, when, when we're talking about finances, the Lord is not after our, our, our money at all. He's after our heart. He's after our heart. And what about what, the reason what God is really after? He's after a relationship. See, in a relationship, there is a mutual giving of hearts. And where there's a giving of hearts, trust is built. And so when you give, and this is, uh, you know, when we, when we give and we, the, you know, the worship team plays, or maybe sometimes we'll do a song, um, I want you to extend, you know, as you give, that you're saying, I trust the Lord. You know, that's, that's what you're saying. And as it, as it, instead of trusting in your own, the Bible says some trust in, in chariots, and but we trust in who? In the Lord our God. We, that's who we trust in. And that's, that's, what that, that's what the tithe and the offering is, is that, that, um, that I trust in the Lord my God. Amen? So we're in the series called, um, you ask, you know, what, are we, what is this called? Uh, questions. Okay. Questions. And, uh, and we all have questions, but some need to be answered, right? And uh, so this, this morning, we're going to be talking about a question that it would probably be the number one question that people would ask, even those that are not in church. Um, and it's a loaded question. Uh, so I'm going to do my very best to answer it. And this could be an 18-week series, but I'm going to hit some high points. And I want to start it off with this. Um, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Uh, man, come on, get, uh, open back up. My thing locked up on me. All right. 2 Timothy 1 through 4, 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, it says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. So here's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about the word. We're not going to talk about Nate's opinion. We're not going to talk about grandma's opinion. We're not going to talk about what some preacher said somewhere, over somewhere, over somewhere, that has all these years of experience. We're going to talk about the word. Okay, it says preach the word, and he says he's going to hold us. He's saying, "Hey, in the presence of God and of Christ, I, who is the judge, uh, I, I, I charge you to preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Repute, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will ac uh, accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions." Or, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now, we're going to talk about uh, even verse 5 in a little bit, but it says, As for you, always be sober-minded and endure suffering. Always be sober-minded and endure suffering. And then it says, do the work of an evangelist. What does an evangelist carry? Just for, what does an evangelist carry? Anybody help me out. He carries the gospel. What is the gospel? Good news. So he says, endure suffering and continue to carry the good news. That's what he says. He says, preach the word. And then he tells us to endure suffering and continue to carry the good news. And what happens so often in our lives when we say this question, why do bad things happen to good people? What we're really saying is, God, why do you let bad things happen to good people? Or why do you cause bad things to happen to good people. I mean, look at this guy. I mean, look at this baby or look at this and look at this. And what's happened is, is we exchange the gospel for some other form that, that, that makes absolutely no sense. Anybody ever have a box at home um, that, you know, it's, it usually sits in the garage or maybe it's sitting in, in your dining room um, and it says on it, Goodwill. Anybody ever take anything to Goodwill? You know, you have that bag or that trash sack that you're going to get there, and it sits in your garage for uh, who knows how long. And it's all the things that you don't want or no longer fit. You know, this is a lot how the, the church and people 
treat, uh, they, they, we have a box and it's not called goodwill, it's called God's will. It's all the junk that we don't want and we say, well, that must be God's will. That must be God's will. This must be God's will. And we throw all kinds of stuff in this box that we don't want or we can't explain and we say, oh, that's God's will. And the reason, we, the reason, that, um, the reason that we do that is, is not because, oh, that's just what we think, but it's because of this. Satan, above all else, is after your relationship with the Lord. Because a relationship with the Lord, there's trust. And trust will take you farther than understanding ever will. I'll say that again. Trust will take you farther than understanding ever will. You know, if Adam in the garden would have tr just simply said, no, I trust what the Lord says to me, it would have t taken him a whole lot further. But what did he try to find? Understanding. He said, I want my eyes to be opened. I want to see something more clearly. I want to, and guess what? It didn't take him near as far as what, as what God and trusting God would have taken him. A.W. Tozer said this, and I love this statement. Um, he says that the most important thing in our life, it, it, let me read it exactly the way he said it. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the, is the, uh, is the most important thing about us. What comes into our mind when we think about God is actually the most important thing about us. There, it, this is foundational. When we think about God, what is it that comes into your mind? Is he good? Is he, is he always good? Is he, is, does he have the ability? Or when you think about God, are you thinking, oh, I just don't really know. I just really don't know. Hmm. So here's what happens. Ultimately, what, when we think about God, often... Our, our circumstances have allowed uh, or have, have governed our beliefs about him. But the, it's actually the complete opposite. Our beliefs are to govern our circumstances, not our circumstances to govern our beliefs. And so w instead of say, say, finding out what, who God is, we look at a circumstance and we say, oh, that must be God. And, you know, I've heard people say this, I wish God would just create a place where there was no sickness. And I mean, why, why couldn't God just create a place where there's no sickness and no disease and no tears and no pain and no... Well, he did. And it was called the Garden of Eden. And a snake ruined it. And he's still slithering into people's lives and lying and waiting for an opportune time. The Bible says he's going to, just as he left Jesus, he, he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. And he left for a more opportune time. When the circumstances is just right, you know what he's going to come and question? The character of God. Amen. Your relationship with God. If God really loves you, then why is this happening? And so we're going to attempt to answer this question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, let me first establish this. There's actually no good people. There was one good person, and he got crucified. So there is no good people. And, and the fact of the matter is, is all of us are, we should be asking the question, why do good things happen to such bad people? Right? I mean, but you know the thing about it is, is we don't recognize the good things that are in our life on a daily basis. It's amazing how quickly we forget how good God is. I mean, I just, we just had a, a, a week of hunting, which, you know, some of you all don't like hunting. But we had, a, if there was something that you enjoy, we just had a week, four or, or two and a half days of hunting that you couldn't write a, a better storyline. I mean, it was amazing. All three of my kids got, got, got bucks, nice bucks, all of them. And I got the biggest one on the camera that I had pictures of without even hunting. You know, I mean, I'm just walking through, you know, you couldn't write it. But you know what? It seems so far away. That was Saturday night and Monday and Tuesday last week. But I'm dealing with this right now, and all I can see is where I'm at. I don't even remember the goodness of God. How, I mean, how many of you know what I'm talking about? I mean, God can come through in an amazing way, and you get the greatest report ever, and uh, about the cancer being gone, and, and, and oh, we can't find it, and then you get a bill, a, a late bill in the mail, 
Uh, they say it didn't make it to your address somehow. It's $130, and all hell breaks loose because you don't know how you're going to come up with $130. Yet you had one that healed you of cancer just a moment ago. You had this report. But where is he now? Well, let me just tell you, he's never left you, and he's never forsaken you. He's not forsaken you now. But why do bad things happen to good people? We're going to have to answer that question. All right? So I want to talk a couple of things that we say um, reasons that, that people have given, and I'll tell you this: these are these are teachings that I, they don't have they don't have scriptural basis. Okay, so I'm just going to give you like three of the most popular things. We're going to try to hit some high points this morning. I believe this message is really going to bless you. So, number one, God needs to teach us something. That's the number one. What I would say the number one reason that people, you know, the reason bad things happen is, you know, hey, you know, it's okay. God's just trying to teach you to trust Him a little more. You just got to trust God. This is what we, we, we hear this, and, and you know, God's just trying to teach you. Well, if God's trying to teach you, and, and, and he put sickness on you to teach you something, then why in the world are you going to the hospital? We, we need to, we're, we're, we're silly. But we say, we, we say this statement because God is trying to teach us. Because we got to explain something, so we throw it in the goodwill box. Instead of going to God's word, and you know, the Bible says there's cer- there are certain things that are secret that belong to the Lord. There are some things that are secret that we don't know. But one thing we do know is that God doesn't put sickness on us to teach us anything. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We'll look at that here in a little, in a little bit. But here's just these three things. Uh, God needs to teach us something. Did you know that God is completely capable of teaching you through his word and his spirit? He doesn't need sickness or a stick to whack you up on the head to teach you something. That's, when you do that to your children, you know, well, that'll teach them. You ever, you ever done that? Maybe I'm the only one that's like, you know, well, maybe they'll learn not to jump off that cliff, you know. Maybe they shouldn't be climbing that tree so high. That, they'll, they'll learn. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That's not good parenting. When they put their hand on the stove and, and you go, they'll learn. That's not good parenting. That'll teach them. But they won't do that again. Huh? You know, we've done that. Maybe not to that extreme, but you understand. He's like, you did. well, they'll learn not to do that. They'll learn not to ride barefoot on their bike. You know? I, I, I'm telling uh, my wife, she, she, used to, she learned the hard way. Um, she was riding on her bike, and she tells this story. She was really little. Um, it's like a few years ago. Um, no. <laughs> Uh, and she was riding on her bike, and she was riding down there, and she thought, I wonder what would happen if I just stick my foot right in the middle of that wheel. And because, you know, they're going, you know, I wonder if I could get it. In. Yeah, sure enough, she find out. That'll teach you. <laughs> and you learn the hard way. And so what, we think that God is trying to teach us something, don't we? We think that he's trying to teach us something, and, uh, and we got to learn. But God is capable, and this is why he gave us the Holy Spirit. He said, hey, guess what? It's better that I go away because I'm going to send you a comforter, a teacher, a helper, an advocate. He's going to tell me all the things that he spoke to me. He's going to reveal the truth of God to me at my level. How many of you are thankful that he can do it at your level? I know I am thankful he can do it at my level of understanding. One of the other ones that people um, use is he's using us to teach us. But there's this one that people tell us a lot is God's, you know, he's punishing you. The problem with that is, you know, and this is the church that believes this a lot. Well, you're just being punished for what you did. You're being punished. But the problem with that is, is that Jesus took all of our punishment on the cross. So how can, how can you be punished twice if God's a just God? And he's a just God. So he's being, you're being punished. But that, that can't be right. Um, and then there's this last one. And uh, this might really challenge some of us this morning, um, uh, is this, because of our sin. The reason bad things happen is because of your sin. Because of your sin. This must be God's will, because of your sin. We're going to take a look at those uh, here in a moment, or especially that one, because of your sin. But let me just kind of hit there real quick so I don't leave that open-ended. Um, the reason things are happening in our life and, and the bad things are happening to good people is not because of your sin, it's because of Adam's sin. The Bible tells us that just death reigned. Death 
ruled because of one man's offense. It tells us this in Romans. We'll look there later. But just as death reigned because of one man's offense, righteousness reigns because of one man, Jesus, his payment for sin. And so you, just like the things that are going on in your life, sin, sin is not... Sin is not the re- reason bad things are happening in your life. We'll talk about seed time and harvest in a little bit. But sin, your sin is not the reason bad things are happening in your life. The things that you've done wrong or the, the way you missed it or, or, or whatever. And God just, you know, even though you felt bad, even though you repented of that, you know, you, know, you, still, sowed this, you, you still did that. And so that sin is why things are happening bad in your life. It's just a little payback because of your sin. Well, the same way that sin didn't co- your sin can't cause bad things to happen in your life, same way your good deeds don't cause good things to happen in your life. The righteousness of God is in you and part of my life, not because of what I've done and because, well, I'm Pastor Nate and I laid down this and I did this and I read the Bible this long. and I, That's not what why good things are happening in my life. That's not what makes me righteous. The reason anything good comes in my life is not because I'm good, but because every good gift comes from the Father who loves me and there's no shadow of turning. He's always been good. Okay. So we're going to look at that number three in a little bit more detail. But because of, because of our sin, because of our sin, people say, well, that's just because of your sin or because of your mom's sin. You know, because you remember your, you know, um, this is part of your dad's sin. This is part of what, you know, your family, this is part of your family curse. Okay. All right. So, um, <clears throat> you know, so many times we, we throw that everything in, you know, this is God's will. He's trying to teach you something. And we put it, all these things that are happening bad as part of God's will. Well, I want to ask this one question just to make you think for a moment. Because there's a lot of people that and I really wanted to talk about Job and really wanted to look into Job. But I felt like that, would, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't really get you the answers that you were wanting. Um, although it would prove a few points to you. Um, I, I thought, you know, let's look at a few different things. So 2 Peter 3.9 tells us this. It says, The Lord is not slow con- c- keeping his promise, as some understand his slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Hmm. That's interesting. God's will is not that people would perish and, and, and be destroyed, but he wants them all to what? What does he want them all to have? Come to repentance, to the, where, where they were headed this way because of one man's offense, death reigned. He wants a turnaround in their life where he rules in their life. Okay, let's keep going here. So, I want to talk about the, these, these, these couple truths that we need to establish in our life because Satan is after God, our relationship with the Lord. Number one, we're going to talk about this this morning. We're going to actually talk about seven things. We're going to talk about four things, four foundational truths we've got to have. And then we're going to talk about the three things, that, that how, how, how bad things happen. Okay? But if you don't have the right foundation, if you don't have the right, the right core belief, again, the, if you have the right foundation, you need a whole lot less of an explanation. When you know that God is good and that the devil is bad, and that's the first one, you need, you need to know that God is good. God is good. According to the word, God is good. Maybe not according to grandma, maybe not according to whoever, some other preacher, but according to the word, and this is where we're going back to 2 Timothy, what did, what did he say? Preach the word before the Lord Almighty, before God in heaven, preach the word. Even though some might not like it, preach the word. And, and, and when things come that are hard, don't just blame God. Instead, keep the good news out there that God is good. This is the gospel. God is good. He so loved the world that he sent his only son, not wanting any that perish, but wanting all to have everlasting life. This is God. God is good. And we're going to talk about, number one, we're going to talk about God is good. Number two, God doesn't give bad gifts. Number three, God, or, or <clears throat> greater is he in you. Greater is he in you. And number four, uh, for sure, and I love this, this is the long one. So number one, God is good. Number two, God doesn't give bad gifts. Number three, greater is he in you. And number four, and this is a, a mouthful that I just thought, I thought it sounded good. For, for sure, okay, for sure, whenever bad things are happening, God is doing something good. Now, I did not say Whenever bad things are happening, it's because God is trying to do something good in your life. Okay? 
Well, we're going to look at a verse, and we're going to look in a, in a moment, and we're going to see how that has been completely misappropriated and, and, and misread and misunderstood a, 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 in a moment. But number one, we're going to talk about God is good. John ten ten. Okay, these, this is scripture. This is something we got to understand if we're going to ask the question, Lord, Lord, why do bad things happen to good people? Why? Why do bad things happen to good people? We got to first understand where bad things come from. Okay. Uh, John 10.10 10 says, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. This is what, this is what these are the words of Jesus. These are the words of Jesus. You know the word uh, of Job, that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. That wasn't the word of God, that was the word of Job. So here we got Job's word against Jesus' word. They both start with a J. But that's about as far as they go in similarity. And Jesus said that I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9 says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And then it says in verse 9, it says, Resist him. Whoa! So you're telling me that there's, I have a play, part to play here? Absolutely. You have a part to play. Our job is to resist them. Our job is to continue to stand steadfast and do the work of an evangelist and preach the good news. This is what we got to un- understand. Okay? So number one, God is good. Number two, God doesn't give bad gifts. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Um, you've heard this maybe before. Ask and it will be given to you. Knock and you will find. Or excuse me, seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then being evil, say, if you then being evil, being evil. Okay, remember, because why do bad things happen to good people? Jesus just called good fathers evil. In other words, there's something, our tendency, my kids, when they were born, were not little angels. I had to teach them not to say mine, mine. I was like, no, mine. <laughs> right? How many know what I'm talking about? Your kids are born, the first thing they, they want, they want, there's, a, there's a, a sin nature within all of us when we're born because of what Adam, because of Adam. Okay? Anyway, so he goes on to say, if you then being evil, verse 11, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So you got to understand this. God only gives good gifts. God's gifts are good. How many, how many of you know, how many of you could say, yeah, yeah, I see that, that God's gifts are good. Let me say this real quick. Because here's a lot of times what happens. Well, you know, the problem is you just don't see that God was giving you that, 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 that bad case of diarrhea <laughs> for your good because he wanted to teach you some humility while you were in church. You need to learn some humility. And you know, pride comes before a fall, so this is why he gave you that bad case. What? But this is what happens. And actually, it says this in Isaiah 5. It says, whoa, guys, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, stop. Hey, like, like you're heading towards a cliff. Whoa. Like, hey, no, 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 don't do it. Whoa. It says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Because we're trying to throw something in a good will or God will box. Must be God's will. So yeah, that you know, because I don't understand that, because I don't understand what is going on. Well, if I understand that God is good, and Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and if I have the, a good foundation, this is what, why finances and saying God, I trust you, is so huge. Because as you trust Him, what you're going to see is the only thing in the Bible that He says, "Prove me now here, if I do not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you cannot receive." There is, he is saying, I want to show you that I love you. I want to show you. I want to show you. I want to show you. And he says, woe to them. Whoa. Hey. Whoa. Hold up. This is your dangerous ground. You are such a da- in dangerous ground because Satan is about to come in and rock your world because you're going to call evil good and good 
evil, and you won't even know who's the father of what. And guess what? He's the father of lies, and he'll have you so thinking that what's going on in your life is of God, so you should just endure that as a good soldier of the Lord. And you're like, well, the Bible says endure it as a good soldier of the Lord. You've got to understand, put things in context. Just because you can take a scripture and make it do whatever you want doesn't, and, and say, it's like, you know, Judas went and hung himself. And then there's another scripture that says, go and do you likewise. So I'm going to t- teach about hanging ourselves today? No. Let's understand what, what the character of God and what God says about himself, okay, and let our beliefs change our circumstances instead of our circumstances change our beliefs. All right. What are those who call evil good and good evil? Who put darkness for light and light for darkness? Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? What are those who are wise? And I love that verse in 21. He says, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, I just, I know. Well, I know how it happened. I know why. And we try to conjure up something in our mind to make ourselves feel better. Do you know that we, there's no, you don't need an explanation a lot of times why something happens? Did you know when somebody loses a, a loved one, they really don't need an explanation? You know what they need? They don't need the words of our mouth. They need our hands. They need our comfort. They need our love. Because we were never created to experience death or loss. We were never created to experience pain. We were never created to have to work the ground and, and have it not give us the fruit of the ground. This, we weren't created for this. All right. Number three. So number one, God is good. Number two, God doesn't give bad gifts. Number three, greater is he that's in you. First John 4, 4. It says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. John 16, says this, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. Now here's what I want to talk to you about in number three, is this, is that greater is he that's in you. Now, Well, there's bad things going on in this world, but if we don't understand that some of the things that are going on in this world, Christ is our example for us to follow, but there's much of what we're taking with the spoon, like just swallow, just take it, when God was already the substitute for us. If God was the substitute, he's already paid the price for that. There's some things that, that he was our substitute for, and he already paid the price for that. We're going to look at these here in just a moment. But there's other things he says, guys, follow my example. Follow my example. So let's, let's talk about these. Because even some of these, that follow my example, eh, we don't like these, but it's the truth. So I'm going to tell you. So maybe you're like, well, I don't have to have that because, well, let me just show you what's going to happen and what he said. Okay? Um, substitute or example. So example. Persecution. Oh, we don't want to hear about persecution, do we? But he said that you're going to have persecution. He said you're going to have persecution, and when you experience persecution, follow my example. First Peter two twenty one through twenty three. He says, "For you were called um, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps." This is First Peter two twenty one through twenty three. He who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. So you're telling me that I could do nothing wrong, and I could only speak the truth, and persecution could come? It did to Jesus. And he says, it will to you. He said, he said it will to you. He, he, said, he said, in this world, you're going to have troubles, Okay. But be of good cheer, because I've overcome the world. But he says, guys, hey, guess what? There's going to be persecution. And if you are trying to avoid persecution, you're not following his example. Oftentimes, we become pleasers of man rather than pleasers of God to avoid persecution. And what's happening is we are actually walking in a way that's opening the door to the enemy to wreak havoc in our lives because we're trying to get out of something that God said, hmm, so we side with what somebody else says instead of what God says. We now be call, call good evil and evil good because we don't want to experience persecution. 
It goes on to say, uh, he who committed no sin nor deceit was found in his mouth, who when he was revealed did not revile in return. In other words, guess what? He was hated on, and he didn't hate it back on them. In other words, they, he was gossiped, and he was backstabbed, and he was this, and he was that, and he said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Wow. Whoa. What, is, what, what an example. What an example. He, he was, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed, himself, uh, he committed himself to him who judges righteously. In other words, the, guess what? I am your defender. I remember my wife telling me um, uh, about that in, in a season when things were just kind of goofy um, and Satan was just being stupid. And, but, you know, it was the devil. Back. So we understand that the persecution is not from God. But he doesn't say you're immune to it. He tells us how to deal with it. He says endure it. Love them. Love them. Don't hit. Don't fight back. Or don't hit back. Okay. Um, but she, she, I remember her t- telling how in the moment of just wanting to say something back, uh, she heard the Lord so clearly say, and it says this to all over in Psalms. He says, she said, he said, I am your defender. Don't even open your mouth. Don't even try to defend yourself. They're going to just use what you said and make it twist and make it this and this and that. Satan will. Okay? You've got to understand we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And then there's always a principality behind anything that's evil. Okay? All right. So, so we, we understand that there's persecution that's going to come and that we're to follow his example. Another example is that, we're, that this is, um, he's our example, not our exchange. Okay? He's not our exchange. He's our example in persecution. He's our, he's our example in temptation. Did you know temptation's pretty evil? Did you know, I mean, the, the th- some of the things that you have to you experience because of temptation, you might be tempted to lie on a job and, 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 just, and fudge the numbers a little bit because your boss tells you to, and so you're tempted, and guess what? You might have to endure um, you not doing that, and you might lose your job, or you might not get to the company Christmas party where all the bonuses are, or, or you know, how many of you know what I'm talking about? When, the, when, when, when Satan comes uh, to tempt... Now, God is not a tempter. The Bible says he is not the tempter. Satan is the tempter. But he says, for he himself has suffered, um, this is Hebrews 2, 18. He, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted. So there's time that you suffer being tempted tempted. Maybe you might lose some friends because they want to go a certain way. Maybe you, you know, you want to, you want to smoke a little one because it's legal now in Arkansas for medical, medical marijuana that's legal. So you want to have one um, or all your friends do, but you know, in your heart, that's not right. And you might say, no, I'm going to, I'm, I, that's not for me. And they might say, what do you think you are? Mr. Too good for everybody else. And they start some rumors about you, about some crazy thing. And because you were tempted, and, because, and, and you had to suffer what, what was brought about because of a temptation. And you said no. And, and here's, so, for he himself suffered being tempted. He is able also, and this is what I love. He says, when you're tempted, he, remember this, that he is able to aid those who are tempted. God is always there in the fire. God is always there in the fire. I love that, when you're tempted. I love the, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, um, to King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, when they wouldn't buy, bow down to his idol. Here's the story about the, this. The, bring you up to speed real quick. Three young men loved the Lord with all their heart. And th- these guys said, you know what? We're going to get these guys. We're going to catch these guys because these guys are excelling above everybody else. And so they're being hated on and they're being persecuted. And so what happens is they make a law that whenever this music or these certain instruments play, you bow down to an idol that was made um, uh, in the shape or the, uh, for King Nebuchadnezzar, right? And they said, I'm not going to bow to your idol. No. Okay. Anybody know that song, Rush Taft? Okay. That's back 80s. Anyway, so they said no, and they said, and Nebuchadnezzar brought them to the furnace, and they heated it way hot, and he said, all right, I'll give you another chance. Bow down to the idol. And they said, I'm not bowing down to your idol, because the Lord will deliver us. And here's what they said. Even if he does not. Listen, even if I have to go through the fire, I know my God is with me. 
And it says this. Because sometimes we go, well, you know, I don't want to have to endure this. I don't want to have to endure this. So he says, hey, endure, but just remember that God is always in the fire. In this picture you see of Jesus is Daniel chapter 3, 24 through 25. Daniel 3, 24 through 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar, came, the king was astonished and rose up in haste and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of one is like the Son of God. Like the Son of God. You know, it's interesting. This is the Old Testament. I, uh, I, was, I was listening to, um, uh, there, it's called like a, Christ, a Christology, or Christ, I can't remember the exact name for theo- in theology, what it, what it means when Christ shows up in the Old Testament before his time. But anytime Christ shows up in the Old Testament before his time, you see great things happen. You see deliverance happen. You see, the, you see hey, let me bless you. Remember after the pre- Melchizedek? Remember he blessed him? The prince of Salem or Jerusalem. I mean, people think this is Christ. I mean, you see Christ show up. Look upon the bronze serpent, a picture of Christ beforehand, a bronze serpent that was on a staff and you'll be healed. I mean, anytime you see the picture of Christ before the time of Christ, they call it like, I think it's a, 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 um, anyway, like a Christology or Christ something where he comes beforehand and you see before he was even there, he said, I'm, I, want, I want to show you who I am. I want to show you what I desire. I want to show you that everything that I created and desired for you is good. I know the thoughts and plans I have to, the, that, I, that I'm declaring them to you now, they're good. They're for your future. They're filled with hope. That's Jeremiah. That's, that's before Jesus, okay? All right, let's keep going here. And so we know that he's always, he's always in the, he, he'll, if, even if not, he's going to be with me in the fire, and I'm coming through, and I'm coming to victory. 2 Corinthians 2, uh, 14. Now thanks be to God, who always leads up to his triumph, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So again, this number, number three thing we're talking about is this. Greater is he that's in you. And we've got to understand that there's some things, listen, there's some things that he's our example in. Temptation, it's going to come. Follow his example. Hardship or persecution, it's going to come. Follow his example. Walk in love. Follow his example. Trust in him. Recognize this. The greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. Thanks be to God. What what do we say? Thanks be to God who always leads us. Who always leads us. It always leads us. In triumph in Christ through us and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in, in every place. So we got to understand there's things that we're going to face, and it's our example, but there's other things that we have the right to legally not sign for. Now, there's bad things happening in people's lives because, here, here's a pile of sickness. You want that? It's got your name on it, Ben. All you got to do is sign for it, UPS. Here. Want a little disease? Hey, you know what? You want a little torment and depression? Here, have that. Hey, you you want a little lack? Want a little not enough? Here, have a little not enough. Yeah, I I don't know how we're going to make it. Yeah, 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 I like that. Just sign I don't know how we're going to make it. That sounds good. That'll work for me. And there was a, there was, Jesus was our example, but then there was things that we're signing for where he was our exchange. So we have the legal right to deny the package. Okay, let me show you what what I mean. Substitute, 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once, one time, for all sins, for, ju- uh, for just and for the unjust. Wow. We just, ex- just kind of saw that God is good. You know how good he is? While we were yet sinners, while we cursed and spat in his face, or spit in his face, while they, while they were ridiculed and while he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. He, he died for the, the sinner and the, the just. He died for the just and for the unjust that he might bring us to what? To God. That he might reconcile us back or to make it right. Being put to death in the flesh but made alive by the Spirit. Isaiah 53, 3-5. Three through five. So we see that, that Jesus, he died once for all. And there was something that, that you, um, they call the great exchange. 
And the great exchange happened on the cross, happened as he went to the cross. And it was finished after he took the blood and he presented it to, to uh, put in the Holy of Holies on, on what would look like uh, used to be the, the, this table or the altar and, and Jesus, where they would sacrifice lambs and how on earth there was a, 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 um, lambs were brought yearly to the temple and they couldn't cure you of your, your sin. They could just cover it for a moment and every year you'd have to come back. And, but they made the temple Temple. Uh, it was given to Moses how to make the temple. And, and so he made a temple according to what the Lord said, as it was in heaven. And so there was one on earth, but there was one just like it in heaven. And Jesus came and he took the blood that was of a spotless lamb, him, once for all sins, and he put it on that altar. And I love the picture of that. If you've ever seen uh, the story, um, not the story, but the uh, movie uh, 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 Narnia. When the, when the altar, the, 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 the lion, how many of you have ever seen that? Okay. Well, he, in the story, the lion was tied down, and the evil and all of it, uh, her evil helpmates were, were, were ripping out the beard of the lion and, and just, you know, shame, I mean, just, just shaming him. But then they come back, and the altar's broken, and he's off the altar. And, and there's now no place. There's now no more room for a sacrifice because the altar has been, it's been taken care of. And I love that picture because that's what we see. It's, it's the blood of Jesus. It broke the altar. It broke the place where there now, there now remains no more sacrifice for your sin. There's no place. Jesus' blood purchased it. Thank you, Lord. And so he, he purchased it. And so what happens is it, we, we, we realize, we got to realize this, that he is our substitute. So we don't have to sign for some things. So, so um, let me see the time. All right. Isaiah 53, 3 through 5. It says this. He is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. It says this. Now here's, what, here's the exchange. Surely he has bore... Or he has, he's the one that took on my griefs or sicknesses. That's what this means in Hebrew. The si griefs is sicknesses. Surely he bore my sicknesses and carried my or our, sour, our sorrows. Sorrows means pain mentally and physically. There's an exchange. There's an exchange right here for your sickness. Jesus said, hey, I I'll take that. You take this. So we got sickness that, that, he, that there's an exchange for. We have, we have mental and physical pain. Mental and physical pain, that's our sorrows. Hmm, it's interesting. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Wow, he took that on the cross through Christ Jesus. He took that, the care, the mental and the physical Pain. Yet, uh, he goes on to say, yet we esteem him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, our sins, our shortcomings. He was bruised for our iniquities. And it says this, the chastisement or the punishment for, of our peace was upon him. So what does that mean, peace? He, our peace. We now, in exchange for all what we've done, we get his peace. This is what he gives us. He brings us completeness, soundness, welfare. This, the word is shalom, which means prosperity, health, welfare, soundness in body, and completeness in number. Completeness in number. Whole. That's what it means, shalom. Whole. He said, that that is what he purchased for us. So there's an exchange. Well, ours for his. Our sickness for his life and health. Our pain and mental anguish for his. Mind of Christ. Wow, I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. You know where depression reigns? It's not in your body. It's in your mind. And there's an exchange. There's an exchange. I don't have to sign for that package. I can tell him No. And there's bad things going on, and we're being oppressed by things that we have. That, that, that we're, our, our belief or what Jesus has done is to reign over. And it goes on to say, and um, uh, chastisement for our peace is upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Healing. Healing is part of the exchange. 
bad things happen to good people. So you're saying, is it God's will always to heal? Absolutely. Always. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is what Jesus said. Now, you can take your opinion and do whatever you want and will do with your opinion. But if it's not God's word, it's not going to have the power. We have a for- you, all you have is a form of godliness with no power. Our faith oftentimes becomes a form, and what happens is when our faith is in our faith and it becomes a form instead of, hey, have faith in who? This is what Satan's after, is your faith and your trust in God and that he's good. And so there's bad things happening in this life and in, to, to good people or to people that we say, hey, they, well, they, because we don't, we don't know that God's good, because we don't, we don't know that, that greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. We don't, we don't understand, n- number two, that God doesn't give bad gifts, and so we call the gift that he, well, that must be God, and we were signing for the wrong things. And then number four is this, for sure... And this is we, for sure we can rest assured this, and we get this got to get this down for sure. Whenever bad things are happening, God is doing something good. Romans eight twenty eight, and we know that all things work together for good for, to those who love God. Uh, for the look, let me read that a little slower. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Often we read that scripture like this. We know that. All things work together for good. God has a purpose. That's not what it says, but that's how we read that, and that's how we think it says. He says, we know that God's working all things together for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. You know what your purpose is? We read it a little bit ago, that you would be a fragrance and display the goodness of God all over the place. Ephesians 2, 7 out of the Berean Study Bible says, in order that in the ages to come he might put us on display to to show the surpassing riches of his grace demonstrated by his kindness in Christ Jesus. You know what you and I are to be on display for? You know what he says? He says, uh, whenever something bad is going on, God is doing something good. We can rest assured. You know why? Because what the enemy meant for evil, God is working it for good we got to understand, hey, if things are, are going bad in our life that we don't like, it's like, thank you, Lord, you're working. Because guess what? My God, he, he's, he's greater than any attack of the enemy. And what the enemy meant for evil, God is right now working for my good. And what, what looked like a problem, he's turning it into a platform. What, even though it wasn't my choice, he's still going to use it. Huh? Even though I didn't choose it, he can still use it. But he didn't cause it. And let me establish that real clear. He didn't cause it. But when the enemy's working, rest assured, if the enemy's going to be working, God's going to be working because you're his. Because I've been bought with a price. And I'm for his glory. All right. James 1, 2 through 3. It says, my brethren, count it all joy. Why? When you fall into various trials. Why? Because we know that the testing of your faith produces patience. We're not to say, oh, yay, more, more trials. Woo-hoo! We're, our joy is found in knowing that God is at work and he's producing something in us. Not because of the trials. You understand? The joy comes from God working. God's at work. God's not at work. God's not the trial working. God's at working through something, through the trial. He's causing all things to work together for good. All things. Proverbs 26, 2. Um, and we're going to talk about these last three things. It's just, so this is a lot of times, uh, this will be the answer why bad things happen in this world. So you've got to understand those first four things that we talked about. Get those foundational beliefs that greater is he that's in you. Understand that, that um, God is good. Understand that uh, when something bad's going on, don't despair that God's working on my behalf right now. He's working on my behalf. I can do all things. Get, get, uh, greater is he that's in me. Okay? But here's why bad things happen on this earth. Proverbs 26, 2 says that a curse causeless, causeless shall not come. In other words, it says, um, let me read it verbatim. It says this, as the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, there's, it's not going to land on you, or the curse is not going to land on you without a cause. And let me just say this, unrelated things do not happen because of an unrelated thing. Like somebody said, well, maybe because of that sin that you did a long time ago, you're reaping this over here. Well, the 
unrelated, we're trying to tie things together that don't, don't even match. It's like putting a piece of the puzzle that doesn't even fit. An edge does not go in the center. But we're doing this all the time. But number one cause of junk in this world is simply this, that we live in a fallen world. The number one cause of junk, bad things happening to good people in this world is that we live in a fallen world. I'm going to read this, Romans 8, 19 through 25. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willing, but because of him who subjected it in hope. So, in other words, all of creation at the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, 6 through 7, when Adam and Eve ate off that tree, guess who got punished as well? All of creation. All of creation got punished as well. And it says, not willing, okay, verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not that, not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even ourselves, groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and the redemption of of our body. Here's what it says in a less wordy way. When Adam and Eve sinned, the curse entered this world. Death entered this world. And all of creation is groaning and aching for the return of the Lord. And the closer it gets, as you see in Matthew, when Jesus says, and yet the end's not come, he talks about how there's going to be fires and earthquakes and, and wars and all these things. But he talks a lot about the earth. He talks a lot about the crazy things that are going to be going on on earth. Let me just tell you, the earth is going to groan even more than you see it now. There's going to be a whole lot more earthquakes than what you know now. There's going to be a whole lot more floods than you know now. There's going to be a whole lot more uh, fires that you, than you know now. There's going to be a whole lot more tornadoes than you know now. There's going to be a whole lot. But guess what? Let me just help you out real quick so you don't have to live in fear. Even the winds and waves obeyed him. And all authority that was given to him, he has given to you. And we are to, again, follow his example. If it's coming to your town, you have the legal right to tell it, not here. This is the word. Well, you know, it's, uh, all hell's going to break loose, earthquakes and everything else. I don't know what we're going to do. I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to do what the word of God says because you're in the know instead of listening to the lie of the enemy that you're subject to him. He doesn't reign over you. He's been defeated. Jesus kicked his teeth out of his mouth when he went to hell, made an open display and spectacle of him. He, this is what he did, and this is what we need to know, because Satan is a liar and the father of lies, and the only reason people are perishing is because we, have no la we lack knowledge. The Bible says my people are destroyed for, my people, his people, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We don't know what we have because we listen to the wrong thing for too long. So, number one cause, the, the, the number one cause of junk in this world is that we live in a fallen world. The greatest catastrophes that happen is simply because of a fallen world. Um, and, and guess what? We're all waiting for that day. You know, there's something inside of us that really does long for heaven. Every one of us really does. We, there's something that just wants to be in heaven where there's not a tear and he wipes every tear from the eye and there's no pain, there's no death. Everything in us, there's something, it's like... Um, it, 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 it's like transferred in our DNA the same way it would be transferred through these. How does the tree today know and groan? How does the earth today, there was a transferring. I don't know how to explain it, but all of us know it too. That there's something that's not quite right about where we're at. We want that. And it's something that's on a, the other side. All right. Um, the, other, the second reason is this. Adam. Adam. So why is there so much crazy things going on in this world? The earth's groaning. Bad things are happening because the earth's groaning. Number two, Adam. Because when Adam and Eve ate off the cross, or not ate off the cross, after they, they ate off the tree, guess what? Death, death entered and, and, and sin entered. So we're living in a fallen, not only a fallen world, but man is in a fallen state. There's a separation. And where there's a separation, there's no relationship. And where there's no relationship, there's no trust. And when there's no trust and you have one on the loose, the enemy roaming around seeking whom he can devour, there's no relationship and trust with the Lord. And so guess what? Every thought, every lie, every... 
Maybe you should just wife. Maybe you should just let that happen to your kids. Maybe you should just do this. Maybe you should do that. Why don't you go get a gun and go do that? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? How about you molest that child? How about this? How about this? How about that? Hey, you need to do that. You know you really want it. Hey, hey. So there's a tempter on the loose. And the Bible says that the God of this world has, has darkened and blinded the eyes. And so we don't even see clearly the un, of the unbeliever. They don't even see clearly. So there's things that are going on simply because man is in a fallen state. And because there's a separation from God, there's no relationship. And so now when they hear a voice, and the Bible says there's many voices in this world, and none of them without significance. In other words, they're all coming from some place where there's something behind it. There's a plan behind it. There's something significant. Hey, I can get you to do that. I can get you to do that. I can get you to do that. I want to, you're just going to be a pawn. Adam. Again, Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned through one, how much more will uh, who receive abundance of grace to the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. So many times people think it's your sin that caused it. Let me read this, John 9, 1 through 3. Now, ju- now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So your fault, he said, whose fault was it that this man is blind? Whose fault is it that this is going on in your life? Whose fault is it? And Jesus said, it's neither. It's neither their fault. What? Because we're always looking to place blame. He said, it's neither. He says, "This this man was born blind. Uh, or Jesus said, neither this, this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. He's, he's saying, God didn't cause this guy to, to, to be sick. Their sin didn't cause this guy to be sick. This is a result of Adam. But guess what? Him being sick is just going to result in this. What the enemy meant for evil, God's going to show up big, and now he's going to be a testimony. And if you read on down through that chapter, you'll see that he's out witnessing in the temple. And they say, well, who did this? Was it God or the devil? He said, well, I don't know who it is, but I sure don't think it was the devil that did this. And he's a testimony. But God didn't cause it. But what was there, God took it and he worked it for good. But it was, the reason it happened wasn't because of a, your sin or your parents' sin or that sin. It was because of living in a fallen state. Now let me, and, and the last one. The last one, number three, why bad things happen in this world is, number one was because of, we live in a fallen world. Number two, because man is fallen. And number three is because of a simple principle called seed, time, and harvest. And I want to make sure you understand what I was talking about. Number two, unrelated Things don't cause unrelated sin or unrelated pain. Well, because this person sinned and, oh, I don't know, and this is, we do this all the time, and we, we struggle and we are bound up by this. The church is bound by this. We think because we messed up over here, listen, because we messed up over here, God's going to get me over here. That's wrong. There's a spiritual law called seed, time, and harvest. The Bible says in Galatians, he says, as long as heaven and earth remain, seed, time, and harvest will too. What does that mean? If I plant corn, guess what I get? If I plant peaches, guess what I get? If I plant uh, seeds of lust, guess what I get? If I plant seeds of, uh, 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 of robbing God, guess what I get? The devourer. You've gotta, you get the fruit of what you plant. Not some unrelated thing. Well, this guy was blind because uh, the mom uh, drank while she was pregnant. That was a sin back then. I don't know. You know, I mean, this is bad. The thing that's in our life is because somebody did this way over here. Guys, seed time and harvest is a major reason why bad things are happening in our life. But guess what? You're going to reap what you sow, not what you don't sow. So guess what? If something bad is going on in your life and it's not something you've been sowing, don't attribute it to that over there. Don't give Satan as much credit to think that he can maneuver and do anything you want and glorify him. That's ridiculous. But seed time and harvest. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, The God of this age has blind the eyes of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of of God. You know, he tells us, do not be deceived. God's not mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. 
A lot of the things that we're experiencing in our life is simply this. The Bible says the way of a transgressor, the one that sows hard seeds, is hard. I have a bunch more. Proverbs 13, 15 says, a good understanding gives favor, but the way of transgressor is hard. Proverbs 15, 10 says, whoever abandons the right path will be disciplined. Whoever hates correction will die. In other words, there's things that, are, it, it, what, that you do that are going to cause death. There's things that you don't do that will not cause death. If I jump off the building, guess what? There's a law called gravity. Guess what? I'll be a splat. The same way there's natural laws of this earth, there's spiritual laws. There's the law of love. There's, the, the, there's, there's all kinds of laws that are in play. And if we're sowing according to the word, seed time and harvest, what I sow, I will reap. This is why it's so important for us to recognize that what we sow. Well, I, I thought, you know, Jesus did it all. Absolutely, he did it all. But how, what you experience, you know, there has a whole lot to do with what you're sowing. This is like, this is the principle of even tithing. You're, you're sowing here on earth, but the Bible says he's receiving it up in heaven, and he's the, he says, and I'll pour out the blessing. There's, there's, a, there's a seed time and harvest. There's a sowing and reaping that, that it is what, why you experience a lot of what you experience here on this earth, sowing and reaping. But there's a lot of unrelated things that are hurt that you didn't cause, but because it's because of a fallen world, it's because of man's free choice. You know, those people that were on the tower at 9-11, I don't think they were up there going, you know, doing something bad. I think they're all just minding their own business and somebody else decided I'm going to fly a plane. There's a lot of things that you and I experience in our life because somebody else's decision because of a fallen man. But we got to know, listen, we got to know that it's not God that causes the bad things. And we got to know what we're redeemed from. There's an example that he is for us, but there's a substitution that he is for us. There's an exchange that he made for us, and we've got to stop signing for those packages so that we can be what God created us to be, a fragrance for the world. We can be on display for him. Bad things happen. Bad things are going to happen. But guess what? You don't have to be subject to the bad things because greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. And I'll tell you this. Let's stand. If we would strengthen our foundation and our relationship with him, put our heart closer to him, our life would not be stopped. And this is the thing about this question, why? A lot of people's paths, a lot of people's plans are slowed, stopped, or detoured because of the question, why God? Why God did you allow this to happen? Why, God, did you allow my house to burn? Why, God, did you allow this to happen to my mother? God, why did you, why did you, why did you allow this to happen? And guess what? God is not the cause of evil, but he is the deliverer of good. He defeated evil, and he gave you authority so that you could stand against it. And I didn't share this, but I'm going to share this last piece. 1 Samuel 17 tells us this, that David, remember David? When, when, when destruction came to him, in the form of a lion, he, kind of, he was talking to Saul, and he said, who is this guy? Who is this uncovenant Philistine? Who is this, who is this Goliath that comes in the, in the, and is defying the armies of the living God? And he said, and Saul said, you're too young. And he said, don't tell me I'm too young. When, when Satan came to steal from me, you know what I did? I got up out of the sheep pen. And this is what the church needs to do. We need to get up out of the sheep pen. And we need to go after that lion that's devouring. We need to grab it. We need to take back what he stole. And it says, then it says, when he rose against me, so he took it back. He said, give me that. And he began to go away. This is what the picture shows in, in 1 Samuel 17. And he began to go away. And it says, the, end, the, the lion rose up against him. So he took him by the beard, by the mane, and he slew him. We got to get a little bit of David in us. And when things, when, when, he, when Satan's coming to devour, they try to devour things that are of ours, when we've been redeemed from the curse of the law, we got to get a little bit, instead of just cowering in the corner, say, oh, no, you don't. All authority, you are defeated. And, and death and sickness and poverty and lack, that's been defeated. I understand I'm going to have persecution, but I'm going to endure that, and I'm going to keep talking the good news. And guess what? As I endure, I'm going to come through, and I'm going to be more fragrant than ever before. We got to start taking back what the enemy stole. We got to. This is what he gave us. 
I don't have to have bad stuff all the time in my life. The path of the way of the transgressor is hard. We read that. But the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, but the path or the way of the righteous shines brighter and brighter and brighter. Let me tell you, my life is going to get brighter and brighter and brighter. And it's not because I'm a lucky ducky. It's because of Christ. And because of Christ. And I'm taking everything that he has. And I'm not letting the enemy rule in my life. Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that you are a very present help in time of need. And we just lift our hands to you this morning. And Lord, we just tell you that we need you. Father, we, we rely on your grace. We rely on your ability. And Lord, we thank you for a greater revelation and a foundation of who you are. Lord, I ask you this morning that we would, not, we would know who you are at a greater level. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. And show us and remind us everything that you have said to us, that you've said about us. Lord, we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.